So what I'll do, you can kind of look at the board, and as you look at the board, all I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the Ethernet and the power to each of these three Galileos. And uh, each of these Galileos has an SD card, micro SD card in it. Uh, for somewhere along the way, I thought they saw it. Somebody said it had to be less than 32 gig, but uh, it's so I got I think a couple with 16 gig and one with 32 gig. Now here's the the uh, so that's just the that's the plain Galileo. We'll go through what the different parts are eventually. This is the project Galileo. So let's see if we, we can, if I move this up, will it sort of zoom back just a bit? Or is that really screwed things up? Uh, fiddle around a little bit. Okay. I was supposed to play the Intel tones when you open the box. Yeah, so uh, <coughs> Federico. That's, that's who, the version 2.0. Uh, that's version 2.0. Uh, that's with the NUC, okay? The, oh, next, yeah. the next unit of computing. I should have brought it, I didn't bring it, but. When you, I don't know if do any other Intel boards do this or boxes do this. No. So you get a little blue box of which um, I'll pull it out and you can, you can do a, a boing. Do they have that? Is it the same sound they use in their advertisements? Is, you know, the Intel inside boing? Or, um, well, actually, uh, Mad Dog's got the box, but it, it, with the NUC, the box is a little bit bigger. And when you slide open the box, it's actually got a little sound chip in it, and battery, and a little bit, and it goes, you know, gives you that little Intel ring. So that's really pretty cool. But uh, this, you know, the nut costs three times what the Galileo board costs. So I think they they have gone a little bit, uh, a bit been more budget. But where? Oh, Brian, one, one thing I wanted to mention. Uh, sure. We're uh, we're videotaping this. Sure. And the camera does not uh, uh, is not able to get the second screen. So we want to do everything on the, uh, so the screen. It's not, it doesn't get that, that the screen on the right. Okay, good, good. So let me just, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're looking at, and then we'll walk through it in, in a little bit more detail. So you've got just a basic Galileo board here. You've got kind of a standard breadboard. Have, have people done any, who's done electronics of any sort? You know, batteries and lights and resistors. Like, uh, okay, good. And so at the other extreme, who's got like an electrical engineering degree? Uh, graduate degree in electronics of any sort. Okay, so good. Um, so we've got experts who can come. So you've got the Galileo, and at the root of it is essentially it's a Linux board. So it's similar in a lot of respects to uh, the, the Beagle Bone in the sense that you can run a variant of Linux, although this is an x86 instruction set, right? Uh, whereas uh, the Beagle board is, or the Beagle Bone Black, is an ARM instruction set. We could get into that if people are, you know, kind of curious or interested, right? Uh, at the heart of the Galileo board is this new Quark chip, which Intel has uh, not long ago uh, recently announced. And it's, it's essentially x86 compatible, so it, it, you know, should run lots of stuff that people can already run. Certainly not as powerful, not as... Uh, electricity hungry, a lot of other things, but uh, but very, very, very capable chip. So then what you've got along the sides here, you've got these headers. It's a little hard to see just because of the orientation, but um, there are kind of two rows of headers here. And for whoever has done anything with an Arduino, you're familiar with basically it's essentially what you have is you have a place to plug in digital analog connectors as well as, you know, tap into the power rails hook into ground, and then do some kind of interesting things programmatically. And then integrate that Arduino environment into typical programming practices available through C, Python, and other things through some magic that we'll you know, touch on at least, right? So the, the thing here, it's a little hard to see. I'll see if I, well, I've got some things in one of these, these bins that I'll pull out. Uh, on, on all of these connectors, what you have is you basically have a power, a ground, and then a signal wire, right? And the signal wire is either something that ties into one of the digital pins or one of the analog pins. And the digital pins are either being read or written to, and the analog pins are either being read or written to. And those things, are, the way this, for the purposes of this demo, have been set up, it's all using the Arduino developer's environment. And the Arduino developer's environment is essentially 
it, the language that's used is kind of a variant of C, very familiar for anybody who's done any basic C programming. Very easy, gives great access to the pins and things like that. Um, has different libraries built in for support of, for instance, Ethernet. The beauty of the Galileo and the way it really is kind of pushed way beyond the Arduino stuff and is, I, th I think, a terrific hybrid of traditional PC computing practices and the, the more you know, recent physical computing practices available through Arduino. In this, you're basically able to bring what they've done for the Galileo is they've essentially fully integrated support for, for instance, the Ethernet library. So you're programming scripts, at least basic scripts, that would work in the Arduino environment if it had added in Ethernet what are referred to as shields. So essentially enhanced functionality, an additional hardware board that you plug into the Arduino that supports Ethernet. They built libraries for that, right? And, you've, yeah, and you can do ethernet -y kinds of things with it. Well, with the Galileo, it's got an Ethernet socket right on board, but still the same Ethernet scripting language works. I call it, refer to it as scripting. They refer to it as, actually, the programs as sketches. They're little mini programs, basically. Very C-like. And the way it works is you write the program in an IDE that's essentially a variant a, a simplified variant of Eclipse. It's like a, you know, a dedicated Eclipse um, IDE almost. You write your programs, you can verify it and compile it locally on your desktop computer. Uh, it works with on Windows, on Mac, and on Linux. And then you download the sketch to the Galileo over the USB cable that we just talked about with the micro. So that's sort of the process. You write programs, you access libraries, you can do some basic verification and compiling locally on your machine. You then push it down onto the device, and then it basically gets flashed onto the device, and there it resides. Uh, and then when you want to make changes, you basically end up reflashing it again. So here we've got, uh, and I've got these numbered. Each one of them has its own MAC ID, and, uh, which is you know, handy for uh, a few different things. And then they each have a serial number, which is just a way to kind of keep track of things as well. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant to pass this around because it, it, it certainly won't come back in working order, I'm sure. But uh, that, that it may not come back at all. But the, the, uh, so I'll just walk through them. This is a, a, a PER, passive infrared sensor, motion sensor. Anybody who's got motion detectors in their residence, uh, this will pick up essentially motion in and around. Uh, this little device, and that's something that, you know, I just bought and did the soldering and put it together. These things are really cool. They refer to them as electronic bricks. IT Studios, has anybody ever bought anything from them? I-T-E-A-D Studios. I think it's a sort of an engineering house out of Hong Kong or something like that. Um, I've bought a number of things from them, and it just sort of shows up. I think I have actually purchased it directly through their website and also possibly directly through Amazon. And they have these things they refer to as um, electronic bricks. And what they are is they're basically sensors or devices that are on these, you know, basically little boards. And they've done the basic circuitry to give you access in a very simplistic fashion to whatever the device is. So in this little bin, we have, for instance, this is a light sensor, detects how bright things are. Uh, the per sensor is a separate one. This is a big button switch, so it detects when the button is pushed uh, up and down. There's another one that's an LED electronic brick that basically goes on and off. Um, and there are, a few, there are a few others. There's a microphone in here as well, so based on the, the sound, the noise, uh, it will basically send back over the wire some indication of what the volume is. And what they've done with these bricks, you, can, you could buy the components and you could write or create the circuits or breadboard the circuits yourself. But for a few dollars, you actually get these almost like Lego of uh, electronic components to plug and play. And then a key thing is getting these little nice three-wire connectors that plug right onto the board. And, uh, and, and then you can take those three-wire connectors into a direct wires with the little sort of... Uh, uh, connecting points and plug them right into the Arduino headers. But we'll get into some pictures of this stuff as well. So let me let me be able to plug this in 
<coughs> without even taking it out of the case if we're lucky here. Are there any questions at this point? The company that has the electronic bricks, yeah. it's called <coughs> IT Studios. What's that? Can you put the screen on the uh, No, I'm telling you, you know, if, if, <laughs> like, it's one of the... Maybe you uh, the, uh, the cable brushed against where, where the button is? Oh, it could be. It could be. You sure you don't have a remote control, John, or something that we're kind of... There's a... Yes, the remote control is not operate that is Kurt. Kurt? Mm -hmm. <coughs> no, no, it's certainly a button on the uh, console over there that she says screen. It'll come yes. back. It'll come back. <laughs> as long as it doesn't say installing, you know, six updates. Something. Or, yeah. <laughs> oh, we've got yeah. cables over here. On the oh, maybe there's the cables. Maybe there's the touch screen. The, the ghost light cable system. Here we go. Hey, wait a minute. Also, turn it, Kurt. Don't touch anything. You're good. Okay, actually here, the, the LED's lit, uh, just humor me and pretend that you see it actually. Okay. So that actually is the LED electronic brick, right? So uh, my personal interest in this is, is sort of multifaceted, but, uh, but I think from an educational standpoint, whether it's for, you know, anywhere from really the high school age on up, uh, whether it's in formal programs or informal programs, there's this, this platform is now readily available highly accessible. By the way, this thing, as it's booting up, uh, you'll see that the, there's a little LED on it that shows S, the SD card activity. So it automatically is booting off of the SD. The reason that I have these things uh, configured with the SD card is that the, the, the flash that they've got on board isn't big enough to uh, you know, have things like Python and OpenCV and you know SSH servers and a few other things that are, are pretty useful, right? Uh, and then beyond that, once you get the SD card, I presume, though, admittedly, uh, haven't tested it yet heavily, you, you've got storage that you can, you, you know, and since it also has USB connectors out, you actually literally could connect uh, large-scale storage devices as well. So there's no reason you couldn't use these, uh, the Galileo specifically, for media, entertainment, Servers, a uh, lot of different, lot of different things. Okay, it seems well, like one, we're. One thing I was asked. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think I asked this uh, uh, through email a while back. The Ethernet dot on board is a real one, right? It's not just part of the USB chip. Yeah, you did ask that. On right. So um, with the BeagleBone Black, I, I, and I don't know how. Anybody a USB or an Ethernet expert that would like to explain it? So I'll, I'll, I'll fake it and then uh, you guys can clarify. But effectively what on, on some devices they have done is they have, to, you know, to save on cost, to save on the, the, you know, basically the board construction, they basically dual purpose some of the pathways on the board as I understand it. And they share bandwidth for, for different devices. So I believe in the case of BeagleBone Black, they share the USB uh, pathways on the board with the Ethernet pathway. So effectively, you don't have a dedicated USB or Ethernet on some of these devices. I defer to the documentation to figure out exactly what. As far as I know, on this board, it's you know true blue. Uh, you know, I don't know that it's gigabit, but we'll, we'll look at the specs on it. Mm -hmm. But it's it's full fledged dedicated Ethernet. Yes, as, yeah. as far as I know. Uh, they, they, you know, they weren't, that wasn't a place where they cut corners, from what I can see. Um, so does the internal flash have the TCP IP stack, or you need it, you need it from the SD card? Uh, no, I, I, I think the former. So, so, as far as I know, the basic, um, I can't, I'm not absolutely certain of it. So, so the quick, you know, the quick, I basically got these on Friday, right? <coughs> and, and so, um, which on the one hand, is kind of scary that you're sitting in the audience and I'm standing up here since I got them on Friday. Well, on the other hand, it's amazing what I, you know, I think I was able to get done since then. I mean, you know, if you can get a web server up and running on these things and have multiple devices networked and sharing and, can, you know, and you've, and you've run, which I have Python programs and Arduino sketches and, and you've hooked up a half a dozen sensors, reading and writing, it, it's pretty cool that, that you can, you know, do that stuff essentially 
out of the box. Uh, but, but for instance, one thing that I, I originally, I did have to use Windows to, um, you like to create the SD card. It, it, it's, at least that's the way I did it. The SD card that has the Linux installation that you use that I'm, that I'm booting off of now to get Python and these other things. I created the SD card images on a Windows machine. And they have very good documentation, in my opinion, and uh, easy to access downloadable files and images. But it, for some reason, it seemed I could only really do that on Windows. And then I tried to do a few things on Windows in terms of the Ethernet stuff specifically. And for some reason, it didn't really it, it didn't work for me. And I don't know if it was like a network thing for me or, or what. So, um, so I, I know on the O droids, remember in the old days of cable modems, you could stick either a USB into it or an Ethernet. And so, so there's, I forget the name of the chip, but they're really cheap. So when Hard Kernel was doing a whole spectrum of O droid runs, they used the same chip that was a USB chip that had Ethernet on top of it. So you are competing for bandwidth if you've got both things plugged in. Um, they're, not, they're not mutually exclusive. But you're not getting 100 megabits per second, even on a good day, out of that Ethernet. Uh, it should, it probably should be a discrete chip. I'll, I'll look up the, the chip name for you. What it's, do you need? Shows up just in all sorts of embedded yeah. stuff. It, it must be the cheapest NIC on the planet. Because they went for low power, fast Ethernet, and low price. And it's, it's, I'm sure you'll recognize the chip part number as soon as they come up with it. It's extremely pervasive and embedded. I wouldn't be surprised if, if it's the same chip in this. It certainly is on the... Uh, down here, actually. Yeah, unless, they, unless they integrated the Ethernet controller right on the SOC. In the, in on the, the SOC, really? The park itself. I don't know. I haven't looked at the specs. All right. Not on the Odroid. In fact, um, I'll, I'll, I'll find it here pretty soon. There's, 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 um, I, I, I have a link to this stuff, and I'll, I'll pass these out, so I don't think you got to take you know real copious notes. But I have a link later in the slides. To it's kind of like a five or ten minute unboxing video, okay. which which is uh, this is good Ubuntu. This is in, you know Honor of Federico when if, uh, if he shows up and and it's the the video is done by a young guy kid who is is the son of a guy who works at Intel and it absolutely is the best unboxing video I've ever seen. He clearly got a, a little bit of an inside track on on what you know what was on the but he specifically went goes through all the different parts of the board and actually specifically names like the vendors who, uh, who, who provided the chips. <coughs> and he specifically mentions the Ethernet chip, I believe, in terms of what the, to, to the point where you could track back, you know, who basically made it, right? Uh, and, and who's got it. So here's, here's another great gadget, Logitech, you, you know, wireless, uh, kind of, it's got a built-in mouse, it's like a $40 thing from Amazon or something like that. You gotta just turn the switch on. Of course, if the battery dies, I'm really hosed here. But uh, but it's a, it's kind of a space saving device, and uh, and it works really well with. Uh, so this this is just logging on this Ubuntu box, which is I built it you know a year or two ago. I have built a number of them and done you know networked a bunch together. It's the the D525 Atom box. I, I think they still make the board. It's like about eighty dollars, eighty-five dollars from. And then you add memory. Um, in this particular case, I added an S, S, uh, SSD card, so it's <laughs> actually it's real fast, boots up. Uh, and, you know, it's 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 um, maybe not great for a gazillion uh, terabytes of storage or anything like that. But this box here, which is oh, actually it's, it shows up here too, which is good. Um, this is just a very vanilla, clean installation, okay? And what you do is you download the Arduino software, and here it is. And do you want to run it? Yeah, we do. And uh, Mad Dog and others can, you know, feel free to to humor my uh, limited Linux skills, but or correct me if I'm doing stuff wrong. So, but now we're in the Arduino IDE, and every sketch basically has a setup and then it's got uh, which is like a one-time setup that you do to activate Ethernet or to do you know to, 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 to do it we'll, we'll go through some examples and then it's got a loop which is sort of very familiar for anybody who's done any kind of 
GUI programming. It's almost like this is the user interface loop that you're running through, and it just keeps running until you essentially shut the thing down, okay? Um, and then here, I'll pull up a sketch, and okay, we'll show, we'll do, we'll do a simple one. Uh, you, you can probably figure out what this is doing, but the setup is it's, it's running a system command on, in this case, the Galileo board. It's running a Linux system command on the Galileo board to set up, to, to start up a Telnet server, which gives me access to do SSHing into the box, okay? And then, in this case, it uh, configs the Ethernet address to be, you know, this is the address that I chose. The two on the end happens to correspond to the two that I, I stuck on to the Ethernet uh, connector so I can tell what it is. And then what this does is it just loops through uh, and it basically is doing a system call and it's pumping out the if config eth0 to, here yeah, and I'll show it, we'll, we'll see what this looks like. I'm definitely going out of sequence here, but So I'm just, I clicked on that, that button, if you can see, well, it's yellow. Uh, it's compiling the sketch, and it's, you can see the progress. It's done uploading, I'm not quite sure, it says uploading, but what literally it's doing is it's downloading it to the Galileo board. So it, it's done uploading it to the Galileo board. And, and now the sketch lives on the Galileo board. Hopefully. Oh, uh, let's see. I may, I may have. Let's see if I did. I may not have done this right. Oh yeah, I certainly didn't do it right. I. I uh, so, so anybody know what I did wrong? So I didn't connect up the the USB connector from the Ubuntu box to the Galileo, which would mean unless you're wirelessly downloading this stuff, uh, you know, over thin air, which, you know, really only the NSA can do, uh, <laughs> then you, 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 you know, you wouldn't, it wouldn't work. So what I'm doing here is I'm just, I just connected up the USB port on the Ubuntu box to the USB. There are two USB ports here. There's uh, a, a client, basically, and, a, you know, and I guess is it a host? It, and, and you use one for basically downloading these sketches, okay? And now you get into this territory of, well, Sometimes funny things can happen. Uh, it may be smart enough to, if, if I just quit out of the IDE, it may be smart enough to, uh, you know, identify, we'll just try it once, and then I may end up just sort of rebooting. But, so it didn't, it couldn't find the serial port, which it needs to, so you can see it here, it's grayed out, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the button, with tremendous confidence that it's Ubuntu's not going to come back and say you've got 63 updates, with, you know, and we'll be and I'll, I'll switch over. We'll go through the slides and then I'll come back and I'll show you sort of how that works, which is really pretty cool. Okay, so let's see if we can can we put the slides on the center screen? Is that possible or is that? I can. Oh yeah, I can switch that back. I can switch. Oh, can you? Okay, so um, so so for a brief you know uh, PR opportunity here, so. You know, Kurt and others have helped to put together this IoT Fest, which is a gathering of uh, folks interested in the Internet of Things. Uh, and this is going to be happening on the 22nd of February, right in these here parts. Um, and in fact, we'll do some, it, it, you know, after this meeting or midway through this meeting, you can actually, we'll open up registration and people can register. It's, it's free, we'll have guest speakers, we've got some really nice uh, sponsors who are helping out with food and fun things, and uh, Texas Instruments, once again, has stepped forward as they did with the ARM Festival last year, and they get some really cool stuff. We'll have some hands-on labs, I think, with them. Uh, Canonical, through Federico, will be here. O'Reilly is doing some really cool stuff. They themselves have a conference coming up in May, which they're referring to as it's the Solid Conference, which is geared towards this uh, you know, this, this world of hardware, software, and things as well. Uh, there are links to it on this website. 
Uh, Intel is, you know, supportive, enthusiastic, and helpful as well, which is really pretty cool. Um, uh, ISIS 3D is, uh, it's, it's a, you know, cool couple of uh, young folks with a startup company doing 3D printing stuff that is really a world class uh, for an affordable price. So we'll be having stuff going on there. Anyways, Kurt, you want to add anything for the IoT Festival? Um, did you tell them who the keynote speaker was? Or is that confirmed? So we've, we've, uh, we'll have it. Basically, the structure of the day is a combination of presentations, uh, a keynote around lunchtime, and, and some before and after at the end of the day. And there are a couple of, uh, there's someone from TI who's going to be talking about the you know, latest in sort of a wide area, low power, Ethernet, wireless communications. Uh, really cool stuff. We'll also be doing some hands on lab work. And, uh, and there's also one of the leaders in the head of the IoT division at ARM who's going to be speaking as well. So we've got some big names coming. There'll be panel discussions, breakout sessions, and lightning talks as well. So if you've got stuff that you think is cool that uh, we should make sure that we're to, to cover, essentially there are four segments. There's going to be one on home personal wearables stuff. There's going to be one on industrial robotics types of applications. There's going to be one on core technologies. Uh, Kurt maybe can talk about the robotics industrial you know, world. I'll do the home wearables uh, uh, stuff. And uh, Federico is going to handle the core technologies. We're also really interested in municipal, government, uh, environmental, sort of the civic dimension of this stuff. And we've got a few, you know, this is kind of like the LED street lights that also end up uh, serving as a wide area network for cities for various applications. If you have any ideas on that sort of thing, let us know. But Kurt, you want to toss in anything on our robotics? <clears throat> yeah, the, so the term Internet of Things is being defined as we speak by various elements. Academia is trying to get in front of it. Uh, the meetup community is trying to get in front of it. Our, our, I think our particular spin is, is how to have disparate technologies intercommunicate. So if you go when you hear an IoT lecture at, at like ARM TechCon or Lenaro Connect or something like that, there'll be somebody go out there and say, hey, you know, you can control your, your home automation from your phone. So that's so that's a that already implies a whole bunch of protocol interaction. That uh, you know, if there's an API on your Android and there's an API on your home automation, you know, turning the lights on, locking the garage door and stuff like that, that to us is a, is right in the IoT wheelhouse. So we're going to see if we can get speakers that can talk about that sort of space. So it should be good. Uh, I, and I hope folks you know, if, who have any interest in this stuff that will just really take it to the next level. Um, so after this meeting, what we'll do is we'll post on the website the URL for registering. It's free. And um, take a try. If you have any problem for any reason, then just send an email to the IoT Festival at gmail.com address, and we'll respond to that. Okay, so here we're going to talk about, this is basically the layout of the talk. Three things really, Galileo, Linux, and IoT, and how all this stuff comes together. Uh, we've already kind of talked about, touched on some of the, you know, what is Galileo. Uh, talked about the quark at the core of all of this, the new chip. Talked about Arduino, which essentially, if, you know, Federico's not here, but, you know, I asked him today, Federico, what do you think, I mean, this really Arduino is effectively, it's become a, a de facto standard of interaction with, uh, with things, with, uh, you know, with, with the real world. And so the functionality maybe is implemented in different ways, but the way in which it interacts, and we'll show examples, it's effectively a standard. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. You listed our install fest as being on uh, March 2nd, which is Sunday. It's actually on March 1st. Oh, okay, sorry about that. So, uh, correct that. Let's, let's can we just do that right now. <coughs> The idea with the, uh, you know, both to give it a plug for Jerry and John, but also if there's interest in any of these kinds of devices at that time, then we could do something further as well. Uh, and then the, uh, the, we talked about the, okay, uh, we kind of went through this, let's just real quick, how many own Galileo? Just Mad Dog. How many own an Arduino? Okay, handful. 
Uh, how many own an RPI, Raspberry Pi, both being blown black, handful, um, who writes code? And this is really just to get a sense of virtually everyone. Um, who does web development? Okay, handful, half. Um, who does electronics hardware stuff? Half. And uh, who plans to make something this year? So, you know, a majority. And uh, who owns a thermostat? <laughs> There's some new billionaires out there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So I guess Google owns the thermostat um, and the company to go with it. But uh, does anybody own the, the, this thermostat? Finesse? Finesse? I know that's three billion to spare if I want. Yeah, it's a lot of dough. Uh, we actually, uh, when I was driving through Phoenix Hall just a couple days ago, there's a very nice uh, advertisement near the Orange Line station uh, for, for the Nest. So it's, it's been a while around. Um, this is, and again, we won't go through it unless we have uh, time at the end. And we, but, but really good video of the company, the, the, the CEO, the, uh, who kind of got this thing going, and sort of, you know, somewhat about what, it, what it's all about, right? But, so, so the point of, of injecting that, apart from the fact that it's, you know, for people who haven't read it, uh, so Google has, is acquiring, in the process of acquiring this company, Nest, which makes, you know, these sort of smart thermostats, as well as smart smoke detectors, and carbon monoxide detectors. And for a lot of money, and and um, and there's got to be a reason for it, right? So we could you know speculate as to why, but uh, it, it's sort of an interesting story. So this really part of this is to try and give a sense of the progression of hardware that we've seen, specifically in the Linux context, really just over the past few years, which is which in my opinion, anyways, is huge. So this is just a, a graphic picture uh, of of the stuff that's here, right? So you've got the Galileo boards, you've got the switch, uh, you've got the power uh, plugs, you've got the wireless keyboard which is connected <coughs> to the Ubuntu box, and in this case there's uh, the screen which shows you the results of what the web server is, is telling you, okay? Um, integral to this setup is this Atom box which is the Ubuntu box that I referred to, and I put these dollars throughout in large part just to convey a sense of scale, right? Because, you know, if, if, if you hear that the NUC is this dimension or that dimension, you might think in inches or centimeters, well, I'm, you know, I'm not sure. But for the most part, everybody can under appreciate what uh, a dollar currency at least is in terms of how big it is as opposed to what it's worth. But, but this is the atom board itself, uh, in, you know, sort of assembled into this box of... And this is the NUC, the next unit of computing device. Uh, it, it too, it comes more as a, a kit, although you can see in the upper left here, so you have to buy memory, I had to buy the memory for it, man, I bought this, you know, SSD uh, drive, it's got an Ethernet connector uh, built on board, it also supports a Wi-Fi uh, PCI card that, that uh, I believe it may be the same PCI card that you can use on the Galileos, but I haven't tried it on either, actually. <coughs> uh, the NUC is a very nice, compact, small, as you can see by the dollar sign. Um, you know, it's a great media server, you can use it for lots of, and it's fast, and it's quiet, at least in my, in my configuration. So, here we've got the Galileo development board, which comes with kind of, you know, it's got this cool box that, that very sparse in terms of documentation. If you jump out to the Amazon website today, which I did, that, you know, there were like no reviews. Uh, a week ago, of course, there were, you know, there was one this morning, I think, and two this afternoon, and three, and maybe there's four or five now. So as people begin to get these devices, they're going to comment on it. One of the comments, criticisms, was that the documentation is pretty sparse. I don't know if they use the word poor, but it's... So my take on it is that there's a huge amount of documentation, and I'll tell you, I'll show you where to find it. So the next thing that, in terms of the evolution, of this <clears throat> hardware trajectory is Edison. Have people heard about this? Anybody want to describe it? It's an XD card with a computer on it. Right. So, so it's so it's 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 the size of an SD card, and uh, and maybe it even functions as an SD card for reasons of you know downloading stuff or loading stuff onto it. Not quite sure what. My understanding is it's got it will have. And as it ships mid-year or so, built-in Wi-Fi, <coughs> built-in Bluetooth, uh, low energy, and, and essentially quark functionality, <coughs> which can be programmed. So it's got a lot going for it, right? 
Uh, you, you don't see Ethernet sort of connectors. You don't see you know USB connectors. You don't see a lot of things, but you see an SD card, which is the, so. There's a lot potentially that you can do with it. Okay, we're going to do a deep dive into Galileo. Uh, this is the box that comes in. You don't get very much documentation. You get a pretty picture, and you might scratch your head for a few seconds to try and figure out. Okay, what do I do next? Right. Uh, I guess what, there's, there's this guy, Matt Richardson, who's uh, done a lot of early stuff uh, in and around this space. I think he's got a book. Um, so his top ten list in an article that I found uh, of what's cool about this is it's the shields are compatible uh, with existing Arduino shields. Uh, it's a familiar IDE for anybody who's done Arduino programming. The Ethernet library compatibility, which I referred to, before you used to have to buy a separate Ethernet adapter for Arduino cards. Now you've got the Arduino base with the Ethernet on board, and stuff just works. Um, there is a, a real-time clock on the Galileo, which there isn't on some other devices, which you wouldn't think it's a big deal, but actually it's very handy to have a clock that just, you know, on is, is always up to date every time you reboot, you know, if you shut down and you do have to buy and I don't know if you've got a solder on or adapt on the coin. Uh, the battery coin holder, which I haven't done, but the, the real-time clock itself supposedly is on board. Uh, the Galileo does work with PCI Express mini cards, so I've got a couple of wireless ones that also have Bluetooth on them. You stick it on the bottom of the card, and, uh, and so you can do wireless stuff. The USB, micro SD is really pretty cool, and uh, a few other things, and of course, Linux on board. Uh, we talked about the board a little bit. There's a reset button, which is used for re resetting sketches. The reboot actually reboots the, the, uh, the Linux. It happens like that. I mean, it takes no time at all. So I don't know how much they've stripped down the, the uh, Linux sort of to, to a point where they figured out ways to make it fast. But and I guess I haven't truly timed it in the sense that I don't have timings on it. But it's essentially, you know, it, it just happens as quick as it can. You see up top, well, you've got the power. Here's the SD connector here. Um, there is JTAG on it for people who want to kind of get into that stuff. The Ethernet's up top. It's well, I would say it's well labeled. Uh, it's designed in Ireland, which is a pretty cool thing, you know. So, uh, so the back of the Arduino cards is designed in Italy. Uh, you know, this is designed in Ireland. It's so, it's, it's really global diversity. It's, it's, it, you get these things designed wherever they may be. Uh, this really spells out in a little bit more graphic detail what the different component tree is, and for people who are into the electronics and all, you, you, could, uh, you could dig in more deeply. Uh, this talks a little bit more about the, the Quark um, chip. So the Quark is it's, it's just a new chip, and if people get into this stuff, I mean, I first started getting into this back in the, the days of, I guess, the 6502 or, you know, 1600s, and these, these other things that were, where you really could get down to the assembly language level and understand what the chips were doing. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is they were simple enough that you could get access to it. And the other was that it was, uh, the full documentation was published on, you know, the early apples and things like that to really uh, take full advantage of it. The, the specs for the Galileo uh, are out there. They're open. You could build, your, you know, you could manufacture your own boards. The documentation, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages on the De Galileo development board, as well as the Quark uh, chip, are all freely available and easily downloaded. In fact, here's you know here are links which um, so you can go out and this community .intel.com actually is very good. It's it's uh, if you do Google searches on things, oftentimes you'll just be pointed right to there, and typically there'll be. Uh, thoughtful discussion on questions people may have with PDFs detailing really all the technical architectural information that you need. Um, so how do you get started? It's not in the box. It's really not clear anywhere uh, easily how you get started, but it's just you just you Google how to get started on, on the Galileo and you'll come to this 13 page document which is, is uh, you know it's not necessary it, it's, it's functional. It's descriptive and it's complete from what I can tell. So it's enough information to get up and running on, I've certainly done it on Windows and Linux uh, comfortably and, and they've got directions as well for uh, Mac. I've got the link in here for what I refer to as the best unboxing video ever. And 
there are a number of other videos leading up to the, the, the well, the announcement around the Galileo Developer Board. Uh, there are a couple of sort of make a fear type uh, sessions where people talk about it in more detail. You get some Q&A as well as slide presentation and, and uh, those are available on YouTube. This is, a, I just quickly copied and pasted it blurry. I'll, I'll get the text in there, but to give you an idea of what the uh, processor is, is doing in terms of functionality. So you can kind of see at 400 megahertz, it's, you know, it's not a screamer. On the other hand, it is, you know, supposedly dual core. And it doesn't necessarily have to be gigahertz of performance to, I think, to do things that are functionally useful. And the beauty of it being, you know, sort of clocked at a lower speed, I would think, is uh, energy efficiency. Which, if you're looking to do things on battery power or solar power or things of that sort, it's, it's really attractive. And one thing that I, uh, is pretty exciting is ACPI uh, compatible CPU sleep states. So one of the, the neat things, and I think it's really what's made cell phones and all uh, really truly functional and useful, is when, when those things power down and cycle down, they really can put them into very low power sleep states for, uh, unless you're using it. And then as soon as you start to use it, it just kind of boots up the speed of the processor into the next level up. And, you know, or using these ACPI uh, sleep modes, you can kind of, you know, cycle it back up quickly and get to a point where you're doing full power stuff. So that's something that I'm really looking forward to taking advantage of. Here are specs on the memory. Um, it, it's, you know, it, it's, are, are you going to be doing big data analysis and, you know, sort of mega terabyte searches through log files and things like that? Or are you going to be doing graphic editing and, you know, three-dimensional rendering and stuff like that on this Quark chip? No. Uh, I, you know, or if you are, you're, you know, you're going to be waiting a while. Get a well, Watson. Get a Watson. Get, get a Watson, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if you want to run basic Linux and do lots and lots of stuff, it seems this, it feels like this is a pretty good balance of cost versus capability. Uh, the, the, you know, the physical characteristics we're giving you, the dimensionalities of it. I mentioned that we're going to, the four screw holes, I've just got these things on on, uh, you know, sort of mounts at this point in time. Eventually there'll be, I'm sure, cases and things like that. Here, somebody asked about the Ethernet, John. So it's 10, 100, it's not, you know, um, it does have US2, USB 2.0 client and host support. It does have a serial uh, for, you know, I presume for people who want to do experimentation or, or, you know, maybe environmental monitoring or things like that through a, a kind of a stereo jack. It's kind of a novel way to go. Uh, but you'll need some kind of adapter, presumably, to get it uh, to, to work with that. And then it's got the mini PCI Express on the back of the board. Uh, I measured this, you know, using one of these smart power adapters, and it's it's just like real. It's not very thirsty for for electricity, which is very promising for anybody who wants to run this stuff off of uh, low power solar power batteries. It it does have support for Wi-Fi. Didn't both because of time and, and I wasn't sure how it would work in this environment, but you basically need one of these cards. And, and so by the time we do the IoT festival, we'll have this up and running and see how it works. On, on, I don't know if it comes, I mean, I, my, understand, my, my belief is that all the wireless stuff is in the core Linux right now. So, you know, I think, I don't, I don't think, I think what you have is you have the core Linux. And so I think that would work whether you're running with the SD card or just with what's flashed on the device. Uh, this is just to give you a little bit of uh, a sense of satisfaction that, that you know, it, it actually worked flawlessly in terms of installing the drivers on my Windows uh, box and, and to a point where I could then have the Windows device communicate with the Galileo for purposes of basically working with it. Um, the Ubuntu, you know, just it just worked effortlessly. There was there's really nothing involved in that. Uh, this is what it, you know, it basically ends up installing a COM port on, on the Windows box. I'm sure there's something equivalent on the Mac uh, end of things. But I was actually surprised this was one of the more effortless things that uh, and and then and this this actually was I would say most impressive. So there's firmware of all sorts of, you know, uh, types on these boards for all sorts of things, I suppose. And 
and uh, when it when it comes up, it says you know there's there's an update available. And I'm always suspect about these things because you know are you going to break it? It's never going to work again. If you you know it's always those cautionary notes, and it worked flawlessly in terms of updating the firmware, and, and it was reasonably fast as well on both from the Windows uh, connection as well as from the the Ubuntu uh, Linux box. So I'm not quite sure how that mechanism works. Whether it's the IDE that makes that work so flawlessly, but it. Uh, it was upgraded and without without a hitch. So the, the criticism of that you know I saw one of the criticisms on the Amazon website was that there's not enough documentation available, right? And and it's it's true. It's a small box, and and you're not paying you know thousands of dollars for for documentation. But here's you know just guess maybe 20 links to a product brief, FAQs. The data sheet, getting started, uh, release notes, compatibility with existing shields that are out there, I/O mapping, schematics, literally the bill of materials. So if you want to find out what the Ethernet, you know, sort of uh, connector is, it's it's there. And um, in addition to the, so there's no shortage of documentation. Finding your way to it is it, it takes a little bit of googling around, no doubt about that. But I'm pretty convinced you'll find what you need. And if you don't find it, uh, I have a feeling somebody will, uh, will produce it. Uh, so there's lots of documentation available. The flip side of that is that there are lots of software downloads available. One software that you're going to download basically is the, the Arduino IDE, which is the way that you write sketches, develop sketches. And they've got 32-bit, 64-bit. I think this is the 32-bit one that I downloaded. Uh, and then they also have a Linux image for the ESD. And uh, very simple, it, it just, you, you download it, you copy it on, it's the easiest SD uh, sort of installation that I've ever done. Copy the files directly onto the SD, you don't have to do any special formatting, simple directory structure, and uh, stick it in the ESD reader, and you're up and running. So I pretty quickly shifted to the SD model of things to, um, just because that it seemed to be, you know, better suited to my needs. I haven't really delved into this. Basically, what the, the, the picture here is intended to show you that uh, Galileo, which we've already talked about, essentially it's a bit of a hybrid um, of where you've got sketches that you can run in this environment, and you've got a Linux kernel that you can run in this environment. How they're all architected together, somebody will have to talk about that in the future. I, you know, and I hope they will. Um, so here's what I'll what I'll show as we you know sort of get back to the to the demonstration in hand. Uh, essentially, you know, we got the three Galileo boards, got the SD cards, booted them up. We rigged up a bunch of sensors here. It's a little hard to see, but uh, there's a there's a push button sensor. So when you push it, it toggles uh, you know sort of a switch. There's a light sensor, so it shows the intensity of the light. There's a microphone that basically shows the intensity of the sound. And of course, you can start to get, uh, just let your imagination run with the kinds of things that you might do. It's, I think you hopefully can see it. So the first thing it just shows the light sensor on the analog input zero is, and there's a measure. And the measure is you know, not particularly meaningful, 64. But if you shine a light on it, it's going to go one way. If you turn the lights off, it's going to go the other way. And obviously, that's the way if you're building an embedded system. Uh, other analog inputs, you know, simple things. You can do potentiometers, stuff that you can just pull off the shelf. I put in a couple of, of, of uh, I've got the microphone, which is another analog uh, sensor. Then the per sensor is on the digital input, as well as the button. So you're driving the temperature sensor, is it the uh, sensor? Yeah, you know, and I've got like temperature sensors in the box and I just didn't get to it. Um, pro proximity sensors, uh, you know, as well. So how close you get to something. And, and pretty much anything that if you've done things on Arduino, and this is where it's really... So essentially what I did was I took out the parts bin that I had used on Arduino, uh, you know, sort of prototypes, and I just put them in here. Right. Uh, so temperature, humidity. You know, uh, there's one. You know, water flow meter. Lot, uh, you know, so there are books and books on sensors and sensor technologies. 
So uh, at least the way I view this is that you, you may be in the market of devising sensors, of, you know, because that's particularly what you're interested in doing. On the other hand, if you don't have that skill set, which I don't, there are lots of sensors out there which you can essentially engineer in to your own creative applications. So, you know, you could have something that is a temperature sensor that shows that, whoops, it's below freezing, that, you know, okay, turn on the pipe heaters so that you don't end up with frozen pipes, right? Or so that, you, you know, you keep the goldfish pond from freezing up or something like that. Uh, Let's, let's do this, if we can, maybe John, actually, if you can help me, try and get the VGA up onto the screen here, and we'll go through and actually see you, Jerry. See what that, and then we'll just, we'll go through what some of the sketches Where's, look like. Where are you plugged into? Uh, so I just need to, this is the HDMI cable, and I need the VGA. Okay. So you're saying you just took your old Arduino temperature sensor, plugged it into this, and it showed up in the same place in the proc file system, or, or how, how did you, um, how can you pull the, these sensors? There, there's, there's no, this is like a two-pin standard or something, right? It's not a USB. Right, yeah. correct, correct. So the, the so here is, is um, you know, I'll show you for sake of demonstration purposes. So here's, here's a, like an Arduino prototype, you know, right? So you've got the Arduino board, which is this bluish green thing. You've got a breadboard with a bunch of connectors and cables on it. And then you've got some sensors, right? So for instance, I had the, uh, the passive infrared motion sensor on this one. I ripped it off. So it, you know, and I, I made note of, well, was it an analog or a digital sensor? Because that makes a difference. And, uh, you know, you've got to kind of have an approximation of the, the power rails are basically the same. So the compatibility of the power rails. And then you have to have a program that knows how to read that, that or, you know, in the case of uh, a buzzer or an LED light, right to it. But that sketch actually works the same way on the Galileo environment as it does on the Arduino. Mm -hmm. You also okay. use one to calibrate it uh, so the number, uh, figure out what the number means in terms of the actual temperature. Right. That, okay, that's okay. That's, that's better than nothing. So that's good. Well, actually, it is nothing, but that's okay. Uh, we'll boot up and we'll see what happens here. Oh, okay. That's good, thanks. It's still bugging you a lot, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, this, this will probably work fine. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in terms of the calibration, and this is something that you know, I definitely haven't done, but if, you know, as you're doing, uh, if, as you're engineering this kind of stuff, you've got to figure out what, you know, these, they, they typically are going to spit out numbers on a range of, you know, 0 to 128, right? And, uh, or, or zero, thanks, Jerry. Or, uh, you know, zero or one, right? And in the case of this button, I don't know if I put the red and the black opposite, or it's just the way the button works is normally open and normally closed. But um, the way the button boots up, it boots up with the one, showing me that it's, the value is high, okay? And, uh, you know, so what you do is you work that in, that you calibrate the fact that this button defaults to high. Uh, the, the temperature sensor, you know, the range might be the uh, proximity sensor. It might be a number from 0 to 1900. And it might actually not be a linear scale from 0 to 1900. So you need some computational algorithm that tells you a meaningful number that says what that, and that's what you calibrate. But, and, and that's the number that comes in over the, the analog. So, so the, the digital ports are zeros or ones. And you tip it, and you set them up to be read from or written to. That's part of your setup sketch. You specify the pin and what it should do. With analog, I think they typically are read write, and you can you can write a range of numbers or read whatever the the sensor is programmed to to give you, and then you have to make sense of it. Does that sort of explain it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's there's no funky complicated protocols or uh, and, and on the flip side of it is there there are no standards as well the sensor you got you got to get the, the, the document from whomever you purchased the sensor from uh, and they are the ones who are going to tell you what this sensor is going to spit out in terms of you know flow of water versus oil versus whatever that you know air th things like that might give you different uh, results so here, we're going to just cross our fingers, and if we're lucky, 
we'll, uh, so the reason we rebooted this was to see if it picks up the USB. Uh, so we're going to launch. the Arduino IDE. By the way, the history of this is, that, and we're going to go up to the tools menu, and we, it doesn't see it. So uh, let's do this. So we're going to do, do a little interactive. I'm going to shut these guys down. Uh, I haven't had problems with, you know, one of the beauties of all this kind of stuff, I. I wouldn't necessarily do this with other platforms, but just, you know, it's just like, if it's not working, hit the power. And then, uh, then power back on. And, and it's, it's amazing how robust these things are. The other thing is, I, I have banged around these, uh, the Galileos pretty good. Certainly banged around the Ubuntu box pretty good. And they're, they're um, I guess maybe there's not that much that can break on them, but they're pretty durable. You know, so uh, so they're reasonably robust. So what? Anyways, when we when this boots up, we'll see if it's picked up, and hopefully it has picked up the. Uh, oh, actually, yeah, we got it. Oh, you know. Okay, so so what's the first question you ask somebody? When is it plugged in? Is it plugged in? Why are you asking? Was it plugged in? So now uh, let me see. Was it plugged in? So we have one plug for Ethernet, one plug for USB, and uh, we need to get. So one of the things that they demonstrated at at uh, at CES was this power charging. Here's the here's the mystery plug. I apologize for that. So it's, it's good, you, you know, everybody's got good debugging skills. Um, and where you basically, you drop things into these, you know, into like a, a power bowl, and it, it essentially charges them through whatever the, the ether is. Probably electricity. So Intel licensed for electricity. How's that work, Kurt? Maybe. So it's magnetic coupling. So you've, you've got inductive chargers and magnetic chargers. So you have to have the range isn't good. Like if, if you put this cell phone here and your and your electricity charger was in that ballast, it probably wouldn't reach. But uh, I mean, structurally, it's a lot like inductive charger. You have a table with a full electricity device built in. Put your phone on it. So there's, I mean, there's just a lot, of, a lot of cool stuff that you know that's coming along that that um, and it seems to be happening pretty fast. Okay, we're in good shape now. It helps to plug it in, and and uh, it wasn't completely unusual to me because there's there's some subtle difference between the way the Linux stuff you know handles the USB ports. No no, no surprise there, and uh, and you know other platforms might. But anyways, it, it's it's booted up. It's recognized that we've got this serial port connection uh, over the, you know, it, it's assigned a name to it, which is a good sign, and it's connected to one of the devices, one of the Galileo boards, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up uh, our sketch again, and let's see, it's actually connected to the one that is numbered three, so with a little bit, what we'll do is we'll just Change this, and uh, I found you don't have to save it. I don't know. Maybe we'll, we'll we might learn something new. We probably will learn a lot new. Uh, <clears throat> so now it's, it's compiling the sketch. It's uh, transferred it down. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up this serial monitor, and presto, it, you know, fortunately seems to be working. Uh, so what the script did, just to go back to it, is, well, it did one thing, which is to set up this Telnet, you know, uh, process, so we can SSH into the machine, and, and 
Uh, then the next thing it did was it just standard Linux terminal command stuff to configure the Ethernet port to give it a, a fixed IP address. And then uh, that's the setup. And then now it's looping through a command, system command, where it's just basically you know doing an if config and spitting it out to the terminal. And that terminal is essentially being echoed in this uh, monitor window that we're looking at in the background here. And it's doing it uh, with a delay of a thousand, you know, every second, right? So it's a thousand milliseconds. So every second, it's it's basically that's the heartbeat of this program. Now you can imagine that if other stuff was going on, so let's do this. Let's and I I did uh, I may have to call on Kurt at some point very soon to to uh, do do a little bit of mucking around in this thing. But let's just SSH into one uh, root. At 192.168.1.183, which was the uh, one that we just. Okay, so this is familiar stuff for anybody who's done this before. Okay, now we're at this. I'm not sure what the name Clanton is, but that essentially is. It's an indication that the the Linux version that we're running off of is running off of the SD card, and that's the. Uh, anybody know what Yocto is? So, you want to give uh, you guys want to give a little brief on that because that's all part and parcel of this. Yocto is a project that was started by the Linux Foundation, and or at least they are uh, people who are looking after it to develop a common uh, environment for embedded systems, so that you would have the same type of embedded system across all embedded systems. Yeah, that's okay. That's great. Um, so, no. want to ask? If anybody's heard of Open Embedded, the sort of the evolution of that. <clears throat> so, so it's um, you know, it's it's it seems clean. It seems like there's a very there's a strong development community of like really talented developers behind it. Um, but it's 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 like a different you know file system, for instance, than than Ubuntu might have available, or um, you know, or Linux Mint, or other things. So. I just got Google the Clinton. Apparently, that was the, uh, the code name for the Intel Quark SSC X1000. Oh, there we go. A trivia, good trivia question. I wish we had something to give away to John. That deserves a prize of some sort. Good job. Good job. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Google. Yeah, that's good. A good old Professor Google. So, so, for instance, one thing that I, I couldn't figure out, somebody maybe can tell me in the future, uh, well, we'll just do it right now. So. Um, so now this command, which I'm typing onto the Ubuntu box, is being run on the device that we just plugged in, which a minute ago I had, you know, failed to plug in. Okay, and uh, you know now we're sort of in. You know, we're in Python, and we can sort of interactively write Python programs, or we can write more elaborate Python programs and launch them and have them run locally on this, this box, okay? Uh, so that's one machine. Now let's do this. Let's, let's, I never kind of get this right, but I guess I got it that. So the other devices, which, let's see if they're running, 192.168.1.1. Doesn't look like it's going to find Oh, of course it's not going to find it because there's no such device. Uh, 1.181. And okay, so this is the first uh, Galileo in the heap. And then Yeah. We'll figure we'll figure that out in a second. Okay, so here, let me, you can maybe you can do that in the 
Let me just try something in a second, because in a minute that's going to be actually important. To 180, what do we do? We did, uh, we're doing one before, so let's do two. It's possible I may have to reconfigure that, so let's, we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Let me just do this. This is, uh, okay, we're gonna, I'm going to vector off what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to download onto the device that has all the funky sensors on it. So I'm disconnecting the one that we were just pinging, and I'm going to connect up the one that has lots of sensors on it. That one is set up as 182. Uh, this is this is set up as 181. But you already did that. Uh, I actually I was. You're right. You're right. The thing that the thing I'm not quite sure about is why I don't know why I couldn't ping it from Ubuntu. So I was able to ping it. When you first uh, started up that other one, uh, you finally pulled up the ID set 182 and changed that to 183. So this is what I want to do. I want to go to this. Well, anyway, so we'll edit this uh, three-minute uh, dialogue out. But uh, so, so anyways, what this is now doing is it's it, it actually the browser on Ubuntu is going out over the Ethernet connection, which could be a wireless connection if we you know went through the, the jump through the hoops on that, and it's talking to the Galileo that has all these. Uh, sensors attached to it, and if you can see periodically a uh, little green light flash, the LED flashes. So what that reflects is that every time the client requests an update from the server, uh, and the server is this Galileo board, then it flashes just to let you know what, what is going on. Does the per see if the per sensor? Well, it's one now, so that indicates that there's some action. We'll go away from it and see if eventually this. Uh, a, light, switches. a light sensor has gone up. Oh, the light sensor has gone up. Oh, so that's actually that's a good one. So let's see if we can. Yeah, got a flashlight on it. Yeah, we do. Let's shine a flashlight. It's, it's, what a cheese turn. Yeah, good. Let's, so what's what's the light sensor doing? Went down. Went down. Yeah, actually, so uh, um, that's the way it's supposed to work, right? So this, you know, the calibration question generically um, is is okay. you know it's like the button, right? Yeah. Is 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 it up or down, north or south? Everything is relative. Einstein had it kind of right. So, and this is again just uh, uh, so. In that sense, there there aren't standards unless you kind of you know create them. So we've got that. And then the other thing is I don't know if the volume has has gone up. I'm going to sort of reach in here and and push the button and see eventually what happens. Yep. Okay. So the button changed. So I, you know if there's anything that deserves a round of applause, I would think that would. Yeah. Be. Okay, so, so just think about what that is, is doing. You've got this little Galileo $60 board that's running Linux, that's running a web server, that's connected via, you know, it's got an IP address, that's got a half a dozen sensors that it's actively polling. You saw the LED light lighting as it was detecting incoming client requests from a browser that's connected from, in this case, Ubuntu, but it could be a phone, it could be any other kind of device, right? So, so that's sort of the beauty of, of I think, uh, the kinds of things that you couldn't do previously with Arduino in a reasonably economic fashion. All that networking stuff, you just couldn't do it, right? Uh, running a web server, uh, you know, I just it wouldn't wouldn't have been an easy thing to do, uh, but here you've got you could do it in Python, you could do it in C, you could do it in you know pick your language of choice, and because of the environment that it runs in, lots of software that's out there and widely available today for free is 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 accessible. So from an educational standpoint, uh, you know whatever range of computer science or art or media, uh, sort of, you know, creative exploits that people want to pursue. Lots of stuff that, that you can do here. Okay, so the web server is running. These two other boxes, um, 
uh, the, the, the three Galileo boards are all, you know, operationally functional. Kurt, I don't know if you want to come and just do like a walk through the file system. You, it, there's, there's a bash shell that, you know, if people, do people want to see what's underneath the, the root directory of this? Sure. I think, Kurt, you game to do that because sure. uh, you know I once I get past. Uh, so you think SSHD is? Well, we'll just shout out, sh shout out SSHs, shout out some commands that you want to see for the file system, right? Ls dash l. So, you know, at least we're getting to a point where there's, so this is what you get. Now, this is on the SD card, I think. Uh, there's, you know, something on board, the, the device itself. Is that accessible from here? Must be somehow. I, uh, sorry, I don't know how. Um, if you had other uh, USB connected devices, they'd be accessible as well. All the kind of, you know, friendly Linuxy stuff that you're used to, this just doesn't happen to be the, the, the shell that I'm most familiar with. Um, but it's, it's, you know, and then if, if you've got scripts that you can, what's the history thing that, that uh, well, history, there you go. Well, you know, so you can kind of jump in and you can see what, uh, that's actually an intuitive command. You know, that's, that's nice to see. Okay. So you said this was Yocta? My, my belief is that's the, the distribution environment that is, that, you know, that's on, that's on this. How about, how about name dash in? Oh, thank you. There we go. Yeah. Another trivia question answered. <laughs> One of the few that you don't need to You could also do more um, Etsy issue slash Etsy slash issue. This is ISSU. Yeah. Pokey. Oh, yeah, Pokey. So this is the question I have. Uh, for Pokey versus Yocto, what's the difference? And where does Linux fit in it? Well, Yocto is the project. Pokey seems to be, I, I would guess that Pokey would be the particular release of Yocto. I mean, they give them names, right? Okay, okay. So Pokey is kind of like the distribution of the equivalent of like Ubuntu. Um, Yocto is more like the organizational uh, effort to deliver right. these open embedded distributions. Right. Okay, that's that's cool. That, that's all. I remember correctly, Pokey was going to be source. <laughs> Pokey was going to be source. Is that, what, well, let me see, what, the, no. That's, that's good to know. I'll write that down. <laughs> um, um, can you show yeah, cat proxy? Yeah. I, I can, yeah. Just shout them out because cat slash proc slash space or cat space slash proc slash CPU info. Oh, geez, you guys are good. Uh, how do I do this so that you can see what's going on here? Same command. Pipe more. Pipe more. Bang, bang, or that works there you can see it now. So what does this tell you? So, <coughs> well, it's 400 megahertz. 400 megahertz. You can look up the model and CPU family and find out something yeah. that so Five, I believe, is, is uh, like they said, it's Pentium equivalent. Pentium equivalent, yep. yeah. Yep. Any other commands? Just throw them out. Well, there's similar proc mem info shows you the memory. <coughs> this is great. You're building up my history file too. I, <laughs> I might actually yeah. learn something. Uh, do, do we need to do more on this, or does this tell you what you? Um, no, you might have to do more. That's not a lot of stuff. So what mem? Uh, what is it? Pi. 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 More. more. Space or. Two fifty six max. Two fifty six max. Yeah. Less than that, but yeah. No swap. No swap. Swap to swap zero. Yeah. Swap to zero. You don't want to swap to an SD card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would work. Yeah. That's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. <laughs>
up top to your people. A lot of stuff going on. Is that everything? Do it. Oh, it sewed up to you. Yeah, seal loader is really eating up your CPU. What's that doing? I have no idea. The CL loader? That's probably what's connecting it to the button. Is that the connection? CL loader? CL loader? Cool stuff. How do I, um, is there anything that just tells us what's like the uh, amount of space used on the card, the SD card? DF-H. DF-H? DF -dash, DF -dash What was the other one, dash U? Well, D, D U is D uh, U dash H. D U dash H? Yeah, that's it. D U D U slash S H. D U without anything uh, basically shows the size of every directory. Yeah. So dash S is the sure. summary for the uh, yeah. D U D U dash S H yeah. SSHU. Um, no, no, just, just dash SH. Mm -hmm. yeah, that means summary. H uh, means translated into uh, human kilobytes, megabytes, megabytes. Is working. It's working hard on this one. Yeah. So what is this going to tell us? It's going to tell you the, content, the summary of uh, what's available. It's going to check the size of every file in the file. 431. <coughs> Next. Uh, it's uh, it's used. Used. It's used. Yeah. That's what's used. So, so you can see for, a, you know, and I don't know if this card's a 16 gig or 32 gig, but, there, you know, the, the, the price of these things, which is the other, uh, obviously, uh, component of this, which is, you know, micro SD cards are a very affordable now, whereas three years ago, they were very expensive and slower. And I don't know how. Is there any more reliable these days than they? You know, <coughs> if you were. Those are like ten bucks a piece. But yeah. Less than that. Yeah. So so they're disposable. I mean, which is kind of nice. Okay. So we're let's go. We'll get back on track with uh, the. If we could put the um, the HDMI the laptop back on. Can we do that, Jerry or John? What's the? Yeah. Uh, Very easy to do. Sorry, I used to not do that. What do you want? HD money? Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. On both screens? Ah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So this is what we, you know, we showed. It's 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 doable. It's straightforward. It's obviously not very elegant, or but you can imagine how you could fairly easily get a system up and running that that does some pretty interesting things. Uh, here's so Brian. So yeah. that that is some CGI script that's running this stuff that's putting it out? Like, what's, what is it doing in the back end? Oh, uh, I'll show you. <laughs> I didn't mean to sidetrack what you're doing. But no, no, that's OK. That's, that's, that's a useful thing to do, and it's easy to, it's easy to do. Okay, so just to show you the program, that that's the web server program. Web server. Okay, so uh, I'll just go right down it. So I, I put another beautiful thing about the whole Arduino community and ecosystem. There's a ton of sample code, example code. There are a number of very well written books, and there are a number of sort of highly respected leaders in the community that are easily identifiable. So uh, there are lots of good sources of information. And there are lots of examples of build a circuit to do this. So the kind of thing where you can focus on and build some skills, and then gradually build up and accumulate um, a, a skill set. So what I did is I went out and, you know, Sunday, Sunday night when I finally figured I better kind of get this thing together, and I said, you know, I got no clue if I'm going to be able to get a web server going on this, right? And so I just went out and Googled it, and, you know, these, these are familiar names, 
I grab their code. Here you see, uh, you know, including these libraries, the Ethernet headers that we talked about. So originally this system was created to support the shields that will go on top of an Arduino board. So you'd buy the shield separately. That's actually the point when I put the Arduinos back into the box and put them in storage because it just got to a point where it was, you know, you're, you're buying, buying sort of components that you've got to connect together. It just seemed like there had to be a better way, right? And that might have been a year and a half or, or so ago. But they continued to develop the libraries which, uh, which now support these more sophisticated hardware platforms. All right, so, what, and this is what we've done. We, you know, you specify the MAC address and the MAC address you just read off of the Ethernet connector on your card. Um, and you specify an IP address so you get a little creative, right? This, this took me all of 15 minutes to, to, to get working. It really was not, um, you know, a lot of it was just kind of uh, trying it and, and hoping that it would work. And then they've got basically support for a server, a tiny little web server you know, built in. So this is starting up the, the you know, for setup, so you're starting up some, some uh, you know, kind of functional elements. Here, the pin mode, you know, this is where I started to add things. So I specified an LED brick. I specified, um, we'll go down further. You know, I had a buzzer brick at some point and I couldn't really get it. You know, so now here you're seeing stuff You've got booleans and you've got you've got loops and again for anybody who's done basic C C plus programming you know something of that sort uh, you know you can get and now what they're doing is they've got a client library and the client library is printing out essentially HTML stuff which it's now shuttling back across the wire to whoever the client is that's requested it and so what I do is I well we. Um, we get down a little further, and so I say, well, look, it's the analog channel that it's, you know, so it loops through a bunch of channels, and, and then what I did, which they hadn't done, but I do, I say, okay, which analog channel is it that you're pumping data out on, and, you know, and stuff in some additional text that tells this, this audience that it's a light sensor, or that in these cases, since they weren't being used on a sign. Or you go down here and you say, well, if it's analog channel 5, that happens to be where I put the microphone, let them know that that... So that just shows how easily you can build up this communication uh, system. And then it gets down here, and, and then I do the same thing for the digital channels. So what it does is it goes out and it reads the digital pins that I've told it to read, and it gets some kind of a value that you know comes back and that all depends on what the sensor is that you know that it's going to spit back and I do the same thing and then uh, you know and, and so it just continues to loop through that so that is I guess that's a fairly complicated sketch in some sense I mean we've got a web server it's pulling information real time off of these pins and it's also at the same time updating the LED to show that there's activity that's taking place. And so you can just imagine anything that whether you wanted to have something that was checking um, if, if a system was up, if a door was open, if the refrigerator was on, what the temperature was, were the lights on, were the lights off. There's really a lot of things that you can you can do. Is that? So can it, can it do multiple times, like requests at the same time? Or Basically, just I don't know if this code is re-entered. Uh, I don't know if it is either. Uh, so, so the flip side of it is, but well, this isn't the way I do it, right? So, so I mean, this is the only way you could do it with Arduino. But uh, you know, the way I do it. I'm wondering if if there is a easier way to run the web server on the, on the Linux side, Absolutely. and then have have some other CGI script pull the sensors and grab the data that way. That way you could, in theory, serve multiple requests at the same time. Right. right. Multiple different, you know, clients are requesting the same page, right? Right. You could run, like, HTTPD or Nginx or some, like, you know, not full-blown Apache, but something yep. you know, less. Yep. 
So, so what I'll do between you know now and the, the Internet of Things Festival is uh, so what I want to do is I want to put Dart on it, right? Which is this thing that Google's been working on, and and uh, you know I actually got it running on the the BeagleBone, right. and you know I had to kind of compile it and the, the tool chain stuff and all that to ARM, and it worked, and it worked well, and so but on this I actually don't even have to recompile it. I don't think theoretically well, I should. Depends if the existing binary expect something greater than a pandemic instruction. That's right, that's yeah. right. So, so that's where it will get interesting and I just kind of, you know, throw out my hands knowing that the other thing I could have done fairly easily is to, to uh, you know, Python's got like a one-line web server, right? And we could, you know, if anybody wants to stick around, we could just fire it up and see if it worked. And so, for me, it was kind of an academic exercise of, well, will it work? It actually, you know, there's no question about it. It should work. So, on this Galileo board, particularly with the SD installation, You've got full-blown Python, and a full-blown Python, full Python has support for this functionality, which it does, the full-blown networking protocols and all that web server should work. So that's really, you know, that's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty snappy. But yeah, so no, I completely agree. Wouldn't do this through Arduino. Mostly did it as an exercise to just show the capabilities of, of now, you can make an argument that says, well, what if you didn't have the core chip, and what if you didn't have... But I, th I think this is where it gets to the, the Arduino as a standard. In increasingly, I think the, 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 the stuff, that the calibration elements of this, the idea of you've got pins that are supported and deeply integrated into the languages. To do, to access the pin uh, readings and sensors from Python, I sort of ventured down that, uh, we'll get to it. I mean, the, the grid, the matrix of pins and functionality and calls, it's its pretty uh, heavy lifting right now. But someday it won't be so bad. I'm, I'm sure over time they might, somebody might build libraries for those, so right. you don't have to. Right. So the, the intent here was just simply to show that you can have web servers, which, you know, my, my sense is that the web server that we just saw running is probably one of the least efficient web servers that you'll you'll ever see. You know, it was it was written to to, to in some sense, you know. Um, whereas something else that somebody has written for scale and optimized over many years is presumably going to do better with load and stuff like that. So here was a, you know, it's it's uh, over on on the left screen. Uh, it, it's a simple Arduino program. We went through a more complex one. Uh, but, you know, it's the same, it's programming. You're defining constants and variables, and you've got looping, and you've got computational stuff you can do. It's, it's sort of a subset of C. So, he, he, so here's what we were just talking about, right? So the mapping, you know, people who love chips and, and semiconductors and uh, microprocessors, stuff like this, you, you know, you'll have a blast with this because you'll be able to map literally from... The, the core pinouts to the headers for the Arduino, uh, you know, pin locations with the data and information that's, that's available. The flip side of it is it's not completely fully integrated yet, but it's amazingly well presented, I think, for something that's, you know, essentially a new innovation in just release. Uh, so, so what is, you know, what's this IoT stuff? Is it just a buzzword? Is it, and everybody's got their buzzwords, right? But, but anybody know the history of, of the Internet of Things? Who first came up with the, the phrase? So as I read the history of it, actually, it was over at the Media Lab. It was a guy who worked for, I think, maybe Procter & Gamble. Uh, he was essentially on detachment. To, and and they, it was in the early days of thinking about, you know, like RFID and some of these other things that are, you can tag elements and devices, and wouldn't it be cool if you could not just differentiate different devices like with an RFID tag, but in fact if you could connect them, right? And so that's a lot of what, so, you know, sensors is a big part of this, uh, connectivity, the, you know, having processors that are affordable and powerful, and you got a lot of them, you know, now. Um, Energy efficiency, these things are going to, people are talking about, you know, batteries that run for five or six years, devices that, that uh, literally just keep on running. Um, energy efficiency, cost effectiveness. If they're going to be sticking th these things onto your clothes, into your book bags, 
all sorts of places. It's the same thing with the way RFID tags. They, there was kind of a cost curve. And at first, it might have been you know re retailers who could afford to put those expensive things on on the, the Calvin Klein jeans or whatever the expensive things that they didn't want to get stolen, and then they'd pry them loose. And but now they're just you're just gonna it's gonna be where and then eventually books had them and the magnetic detectors and things like that. You know, it just it, and quality and reliability. The stuff has to work. Uh, Walsam, does anybody know who Walsam, Walsam is? Walsam? So, so it, actually it's Maslow spelled backwards. But, um, but so this was my, you know, I don't know if this makes sense or not, but you know, what is the hierarchy of gadgetry that we're now able to enjoy, right? So we've got appliances, and these are all things that will, people are looking to uh, connect up to the Internet of Things. Whether it's your refrigerator, high-end stereo system, big screen TV. You know, we kind of talk about equipment. Equipment might be, you know, it might be a computer system. It might be, uh, you know, something less than a big appliance, but it's maybe a multi-hundred, if not thousand. Devices would be things like we got, you know, like routers, or uh, might be thermostats, or might be carbon monoxide. I think, you know, and, and now you start to get into smaller and smaller smart uh, devices that are smaller, more affordable, less costly. And you know, and, and you're starting to get into wearables, whether it's smart armbands or you know dresses that light up or satchels that you carry around, things like that. Sort. You know, the 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 bottom end of the spectrum, you know, tools. It's like the screwdriver. It, we're still going to have dumb. I, I can't imagine buying a set of uh, screwdrivers that you know that talks to the uh, the Ethernet or the internet. It's you know, at some point. It, Less it, of the yeah. <laughs> um, big investment, you know, won't go through this. Lots of people are investing wherever you go. The, the, as I understand it, the Nest uh, company, Google Ventures, was one of the investors in them. And, you know, after they, and over the past year, year and a half, two years, from when they first found out about it, they, they Google wanted to be, based on the stories that are written in the press, uh, an investor in it. And lots of venture funds kind of, you know, get into it. We talked already about the IoT Festival. There are some good events coming up. Everybody's got their hockey stick charts that are, you know, kind of head up to the to the sky in terms of how many devices, how many, uh, you know, things are going to be connected to the internet in, or to this internet of things in the future. That, and, you know, whether it is uh, traffic lights or city lights or classroom lights. You know, I think around here you see more uh, occupancy sensor types of things, and it's mostly for energy efficiency that, you know, if nobody's in, why not shut the lights down automatically, right? But increasingly, it will, it could also be, well, what are the classrooms that are most heavily utilized, what's the traffic through them, other useful metrics. Uh, we talked actually in good detail about some of the components of Linux. This, I'll, I'll add this history uh, list of commands that we just went through to the slides before they're posted, and, and the last one, the ROS, which is the robot operating system. I don't know if you've ever done anything yeah. with this. Um, but the, the folks at, what is it, Willow Gardens? Willow Garage. Willow Garage, mm -hmm. is, is which, you know, they're the folks who have done a lot of stuff on the DARPA challenges, the self-driving cars. Up there you have full fat Linux. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah, don't take it personally. Um, no, no, no. I mean, I, I know what it means, but uh, is it... Is it, does it exist already? Is it? You know, what, so what does it mean? Yeah. No. Would you define what you mean by that? Yeah. I, I don't. I I I, I copped it from this uh, website. Okay, that's fine. It, so so and the reason I put it up there was to, to spark just that kind of. A, um, so my my sense is that Linux is Linux, and those bounds are fairly well. Done. For instance, Wi-Fi is now part of the core Linux. Uh, system. And then the distributions, so I think actually this might be uh, uh, misdescribed. I think it might be more full fat distributions that people, so for instance, the Yocto Pokey distribution we know to be slim, slender, efficient, and well tuned, particularly for uh, embedded devices. Although we saw just based on the SD card, there's gobs of storage, so it's not like there's a shortage of of, of capacity for storing. Well, 
The other thing is that what I would do is I put the full fat Linux onto a USB disk drive, and then I would stick that in the USB port, and then I would just use the card to just boot off of that, and then I would have the whole thing on, the, on, the, on that. I wouldn't got swap space or anything else on there. Could you still uh, grab, could you, if you had the full distro on the, the, the <coughs> external card, could you still grab stuff off of it, and, and it would just dynamically load? Is that the way it would work? You know well, I, the reason I would, I would not want to put stuff in the SD card is because of all the issues of uh, wearing, you know, and stuff like that. But if I just, I could have either a, a, an SSD type of device, or I could have, or I could, I see. I could plug a, a flash, a flash drive, and you know, USB flash drive into it, and the USB port, and then run off of that. You know, Wouldn't the a USB flash drive like a thumb drive? A thumb drive, or I've got a I've got a two terabyte USB drive. Right. Right. Uh, so, the question: Do the thumb drives have the same wearability uh, detractors as the SD card, or is the, or is the yes, they, they do. do? Okay. So, you, certainly with an SSD, or some, there are less wearability concerns. Well, the thing is, though, with the USB, I mean, they have USBs that go up to I think 128 gigabytes now, and you know, they they level over the entire drive. At least the good ones. So you have much less likely to wear that out as you would if you had like a four gigabyte flash gotcha. on an SD card. So the question I have that I, I, if anybody has an answer to, I don't know the technical answer to it. Can you, could you have it configured in that way, which is that you boot from uh, sort of a tiny Linux in some sense on the whatever your built-in flash is or your SD card, and then configure it in such a way that it grabs all the other fat stuff off of these other, could it be configured in that way? And what would it take? Yes. To, so, yes. Yes. so that might be an exercise for uh, homework assignments to, to do that. I mean, you could, I, mean I have, uh, you could even do simple things like, um, there's, a, there's a tool called Flash Hybrid that uses up some of your memory to store things, files that have, are, are frequently updated, like your whole bar file system can be on, on essentially eats up a little bit of RAM but saves your saves your flash from getting yeah. you know hammered on. So there, there are things that you can do, yeah. and then for like your home directory and other stuff, you can mount other you know rotating disk part, you know, mounts, right? So yeah. you could do you could mix and match yeah. all these things. So you could have just your kernel and <coughs> most frequently used stuff that are mostly read only on a on a flash you know partition, yeah. and have your like you know videos and other stuff on a on a big rotating drive. When you SD card, you could have a little bit of code that would boot over the network and then just pull everything over the network. So, so th this is, a, I think, another thing that, to me at least, is really exciting, and from a, particularly from a Linux standpoint, right? That that you can have. I mean, you've got a sixty-dollar Linux computer <coughs> that, if people want to become educated, whether self-educated or in classroom settings or in your corporate settings, uh, here's your opportunity to do it so that you could then move to the next step to do these customizations. And at least my limited experience thus far is that the p performance of this device is sufficient that, you know, in terms of all the stuff we did for uh, to viewing the top and viewing the other activities, and you can really get in and interactively um, inspect what's going on on this device. So it's, I think, very promising from uh, these are the upcoming events, and uh, that's pretty much it. So, any thank you for sitting through it and tolerating it. But any questions or comments? So, I, I don't think Yocto uses a bootloader. So, I've, I've been using this thing called Yocto Arago on the TI Keystone too, and fat and full it is not. I mean, it's a glorified busy busy box. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so ideally, I'd like to be able to do something. Odroid loves hacking up U-boot and using U-boot to either boot over the net or, or doing USB start and booting off of the flash drive or something like that. But I don't think there's an equivalent. If this thing is, is not booting from a bootloader, then I don't think I have the option to do U-boot into some exotic operating system. I think, so, so I guess that's my question. Is Yocto monolithic? I mean, is that why they did it that way? Because we certainly don't have any options with the TI Keystone 2, and maybe that's the same story with the internet port. So, so is the question on the Galileo, is there a bootloader? Yes. 
That's the question. There's, I mean, there's got to be, but it's probably a tiny thing embedded within the internal flash. Yeah. So then the, the next question is, is it one of the standard bootloaders that's out there? So for instance, the standard bootloaders that are out there today are? So uh, everybody I know that has SD card booting uses U-boot. U-boot? Yeah. yeah. Good question. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the answer. I also have a question. You said it costs $60. Is that just for the board, or would that also include an like, AC adapter and a case of the So 60 bucks. 60 bucks comes with, with the power. adapter, with the adapter, and all the plugs that you'll that we use, and the board. So uh, you, you need to add to that the USB cable for sure, mm -hmm. which you probably have because you're following. And uh, if you want to do like Python and stuff like that, you know, an SD card, but you could probably peel is it out. Is it full size uh, USB or is it mini or a micro? It's a, it's a micro. Micro. Uh, micro. Okay. Can I have a show? Thank you, Brian. <laughs> you're welcome. Thank <laughs> you.